No, <laughs> there's definitely not. I did not read. No, I I anticipate this is gonna take up the whole time. And it was cold. <laughs> <laughs> it was real cold. <laughs> Wait, it wasn't that cold last night. Did you review it last night? It is when you're in the rain. No. Oh. In the rain. What's that song? There's a song that has. What's that called? Well, there's Purple Rain. I'm not thinking of Purple Rain though. Purple Rain. Um. So we are doing something a little bit different today. <clears throat> Typically, we have a review. We're gonna switch it up. Um, and the reason I decided that I wanted to switch it up today is simply for the fact that I get a lot of questions about various topics of cigars, and we've really never addressed a lot of them in depth on the podcast. Maybe every once in a while we will, and we've done a little bit of this in the past, but really what I want to name this segment is lessons learned in the cigar world, which there's tons that we have learned over an extended period of time. I've certainly for myself over the course of 13 years. I've learned a lot of lessons in cigars, and, and hopefully this shortens the learning curve. I mean, that's my intention, that it shorts the learning curve for everybody else who's kind of in that, um, I want to get into it, but I don't know enough yet. How do I begin? It seems overwhelming. Um, so start to do so interlace some segments in for very topical things that I think may help shorten that learning curve a little bit, just based upon our own experiences. Um, so that's the whole intention of this podcast. Before we actually get into the podcast, though, I do want to say... There was a um, uh, Skip Martin, who is the owner of Romacraft. He is essentially has decided to review the reviewers He's, and yeah. came out and um, joined the Cigar Coop primetime show, which always is on Fridays, uh, with a panel of like four or five people to discuss, okay, well, who are the best of the best in terms of reviewers? Um, who do you give high marks to and so on? And I would like to just present to this audience that, your boys were named number two. I was a little disappointed that we didn't <laughs> <laughs> that we didn't achieve number that one. We status. didn't get number one. Now, now the only thing that I can say is that we probably <laughs> didn't achieve number one status simply for the fact that we didn't actually put Aroma Craft in our top ten. That's fair, and I want to make an announcement. We will never put a Romacraft <laughs> in our top 10. <laughs> no. Ro- <laughs> Romacraft was reviewed in 2019, but based on our top cigars of 2019, the cigars that did make that list were both cigars that myself and Corey both reviewed as well as community uh, right. audience members. So when it came to it, there was high-graded Romacrafts last year on our site and things that we've reviewed and have in the backlog, they just didn't make the top 10 because it required both myself and Corey to be in that list of right. reviewers. That said, Skip, I feel like awards or rewards are necessary for receiving your top, um, you know, the second place position, top, right. top five reviewers. So um, if I could make a recommendation on some type of award or reward for for reaching such a high reputable position maybe some bacas would be nice <laughs> uh, bacas would be nice skip um, um, because i have a strong feeling and some of those new crow magnet fomorians um, cuz i would say that if we reviewed those there's a very fucking good chance they're going to be like 93s and up. Yeah, what's what's essentially funny about the whole thing is like, um, uh, you know, it, and I want to go back to exactly our process, right? One of the things we always do, and I think there's a lot of times, or, you know, especially with Cigar Aficionados Top 25 that comes out and some other folks, you know, there's some... There's some rumors, I don't even want to call them rumors, but there's some suggestions out there that it's not always a peer of a process is that you would want it to be. One of the things that Chris and I really try hard to do is take biases out of everything. Even though we do have relationships with manufacturers, we get provided samples. One of the things that we always do up front, and I make sure that I do in consideration for smoking anyone's cigars, just did it this last week, had someone approach us and said, hey, we love for you to review our cigars, and my response is always this. We were, we'd were we be so happy to review your cigars. We're glad you're producing them. However, just know that we are going to be as unbiased as possible. So if your cigar is something that we are not really in favor of, it's not favorable either from a taste perspective, from construction burn, how we actually grade and process these cigars, if it's not favorable, we are going to put that content out. So just be warned that no matter what, 
the content is going to go out either in your favor, perhaps, or not in your favor. But we set that expectation up front because we really are trying to be as objective as possible in our process and taking those biases out of it. So there's no pay to play. We don't make money off of the reviewed cigars, nothing like that. We do get the provided samples from some manufacturers, but not always. A lot of times we're purchasing these on our own. Um, Either way, our scoring process stays the same. And you know, some manufacturers like that, some don't. I kind of look at it as like you get exposure regardless. So I, I think in some sense you should be thankful for that anyway. But I think to create a purity around what we do is probably the most important function of how we actually review. So I think that translates, and I want to go back to even what Skip said. I think sometimes that really translates well for us in what we do is that it's not so much um, – we can only smoke so many cigars. We can only review so many, but really in those cigars, we're just, we're throwing it out there as far as what we like and what we don't like. And you may, you may agree. You may disagree. We're just putting it out there. Um, it may be something that is in alignment with certain people's flavor profiles. They may get similar experiences or they may not. Again, this is, this is just something that we're doing that we're putting out there as a resource and information for other people. So it's kind of nice to hear that, you know, it was, it was well received by somebody that Chris and I, a hundred percent have the most respect for yes, in the industry. Very much so. Um, an insane mind. So let's, let's, uh, there was not one. I don't think that I didn't think was an excellent cigar. Um, the, the, um, the hot ticket guys, not only did I find their list really valid, I also, and, and I don't think they even had any of my products on their list. Sorry. If, if I'm right, I don't think they did. We will. But, um, I really, really enjoy the work that they did this year. Did Coop paint? Right? What happened to Coop? So the best part about that is the guy who was hosting the show after Skip started saying that just walked away, <laughs> which I think is fucking hilarious. I he was actually laughing. He probably had to poop. You know, really, I think a lot of those guys don't like and appreciate what we do, and that's okay. Um, maybe they do. Maybe they don't. I don't really know. I'm only speculating, but... I know that there's folks that have been around the industry for a long time who very much dismiss what we're doing, but I look at it and it's like, that's okay. You're probably going to pass away first, so it's okay. Oh, um, God. oh God, that's harsh. That's why, so would I, why would I say such a thing? No, I'm just kidding. I just it's a feel fucking like, joke. I, I feel like we just, I, it, whether it was intentional or not, I think it was intentional. We, we probably shook up kind of the whole f- formula of how reviews are done in the industry. <laughs> And it's probably a little May- bit taboo. <laughs> yeah, may- maybe a little bit. And here's the thing. We're not going to... S- I mean, the thing is that we, we enjoy doing it. We-, we publish just so people can get the information. There's tons of outlets that you can go to. And we appreciate even our competitors, or I don't even want to call them competitors. <laughs> yeah, you just, you just defined it. I, well, I mean, they are essentially. But, you know, like, I, here's the thing. I don't know if you saw it last week. I was going through Half Wheels Top 25. And I posted on my story, I really enjoy Half Wheels Top 25, and I even did the little swipe up, go check it out. Because I, even if it's somebody that maybe not like us, we may not like them um, from other publications, I still respect everything that everyone does and just kind of pushing forward the cigar industry. So I wanted to throw it out there. It was a great Top 25. I really liked a lot of the cigars that they had in there. I really appreciate what they do. They put a ton of information out in the industry. So it's like, lots. yeah, yeah. man, it's like, I got to give credit where credit's due. They're, they're a good organization. So, um, you know what? I know if I saw all of them in person, I would hug them. You know, I probably would too. Cause I'm I just that type too. and it, and it and it's and it's not because oh <laughs> the fucking like <laughs> it's ridiculous. Don't bet me. <laughs> um, no, it's just I feel like with podcasting we get we just we like to just shake shit up, even if it yeah. even if it slightly hurts our reputation. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely said some things in there, but. I, but, but I ultimately, do, I, I hold no ill will towards anybody. No, absolutely not. And I and I really do appreciate it. I mean, there was a ton of top cigar lists out there. There's some really good ones. There's other ones where I was kind of like, I don't know that you smoked enough to really get a good, uh, a, a good um, what do I want to call it, a barrel of reviews. You didn't smoke enough to really make it meaningful. I did kind of see some of those where I was like, ah. But, you know, for friends that we have, like at Blind Man's Puff, like they always do a great job. I love their – their review process is actually arguably my favorite because they do the blind reviews. What is the blind um, review? They deband them for they the de-band reviewers. Them. Correct. So I really love that process that they go through. Um, Half Wheel always does a really good job. They are just 
I, you could take or leave the review itself. I usually go to the summary because it's a lot of content, but just the information that they put out and really how they put it all together. I really enjoyed Cigar Dojos this year. That was one that I really, really enjoyed a lot. They have really good reviews. So there's a ton of people in the industry that are doing similar things and doing them in a slightly different fashion. At the end of the day, it just helps what the end. I mean, it helps educate people and it helps the industry as a whole. So it's, I think it's a good, it's a win win in my opinion. Yeah, totally. So it's kind of cool that Skip and those guys flipped it on its head though. And it's like, let's review the reviewers. I, I think that that's fair. Neat. That is so valid. Yeah, it is fair. It is fair. We'll probably get last seat next year, but that's okay. Um, so we're doing something a little bit different in this episode. Um, but before before I get into that, and I don't I don't want to go onto this too much, and I never I never really said anything a couple of days ago. But coming back from the cigar lounge, I was hit by a semi truck, yeah, which is really crazy. Um, and it's a weird thing to like call your wife while you're sitting in the ditch, and you go, uh, "Hey, I just got hit by a semi truck. I'm okay. Got to call the cops. Call you in a minute." And then I hung up the phone, <laughs> and she like freaked the fuck out. Um, but yeah, I got, I got hit. My rear bumper got hit by a semi truck merging into my lane, spun me out in the middle of the highway. I was, I was telling Chris, like I saw taillights, headlights and taillights again, and then ended up in a ditch. Um, and you know what? And I didn't get injured at all. You know why? At the time. But then I realized that I banged up my knee pretty bad on my center console. My knee is throbbing right now. I know why you didn't get hurt though. It's because you spend Jesus Cristo an exorbitant amount of time in the gym. Yeah, that's right. Just bodied up. If you, I have body airbags. Yeah, pretty much. Um, no, so the crazy... You know what the weird thing is, though? What? So I don't. I can't... My claws don't allow me to get to it, no. but, I, but I have the necklace Kale gave me on, yeah. and I wear it all the time. I Aww. wear it for hockey because it gives me good luck, so yeah. I just wear it all the time, and then part of me is like, what if this shark tooth necklace saved my life? Yeah, maybe. Because I, I had it on that day. Oh yeah. So that could have been in it too, or could have been Jesus. Who knows? Um, but could but, you imagine if it fucking took out your fucking jugular? Oh yeah, they'd be fucking just like, like pierce my <laughs> <laughs> pierce my neck. You bleed out. Uh, yeah, it was it was a crazy ordeal. I'm fine. Uh, my car is actually still drivable, even though the rear bumper is completely chewed up by a semi truck tire. The guy was really cool. He actually stopped off after he hit me, which he didn't need to because there's no damage to his truck at all. It could have just kept going. No one had ever known. Um, but he actually came back and checked on me and, and hung out with me for about 30 minutes until the cops came and we were just sitting outside chilling. He's very, said, very nice guy. He said, quote unquote, in the 20 years I've been a driver, I've never been in an accident. Well, buddy, tonight is that, that's going to yeah. change. <laughs> yep. <laughs> that changed that night. Yeah. It's a 24 years of driving. You've never been in an accident. Um, and it wasn't even that egregious. It was one of those blind spot things. I mean, I, I knew that I was in his blind spot when he hit me. There's no way he saw where I was at. So it was just a freak accident thing. I think he got like, um, I mean, I think he just got like a simple moving violation. And I even told the cops, was like, it, it's like, it's weird. I was like, it's one of those things where like shit happens. He wasn't going fast. We were both driving under 65 miles an hour, believe it or not. So we weren't even going fast. It was just a simple lane change. And I was right directly in his blind spot and he didn't see me and he came over and hit me. The good news is, is like when he walked back, I looked at him, he looked at me and I said, you okay? And he's like, yeah, I'm okay. He's like, are you okay? And I was like, I'm okay. I'm, and we both kind of looked around. We're like, it seems like everyone's okay. It's the best outcome you could possibly get. Did you hug? We didn't hug, but we shook hands. He's a very, very oh. nice guy. Yeah, lives in Chicago. We, we talked for 30 minutes. I know what he eats when he's on the road. I know what food <laughs> he likes at home. Uh, I yeah. know he's been driving for 24 years. He hates young semi-truck drivers because they don't pay attention and they don't know how to make good money. He also has two houses in the Chicago area, lives close to the Midway Airport One, has some has a house somewhere else. So yeah, um, anyway, so I'm fine. The good news is... Good news is I'm fine. After the hospital, though, my hands got cut off in the accident, and the only thing they had to put back on me are these. With snow leopard so hands. So I've got snow leopard hands and snow leopard ears now. Yeah. Um, but yeah, anyway. <laughs> they, had to, they act of a snow leopard to give you the organs and uh, appendages you need. The only thing we have in the hospital that's recently dead that we can harvest its organs <laughs> is, a is a first leopard. snow leopard. <laughs> Um, yeah. yeah, dude, the whole thing, the whole thing was just kind of weird. It shook me up a little bit. I was telling Lauren yesterday, we were out to dinner for her birthday and uh, I was sitting at dinner. I was like, I didn't tell you this, but like, so when I came home, I was like, I was fine. Like even after the whole thing happened, I was like shaking up a little bit, but I was, I was fine. I was like, Hey, I'm hungry. Let's eat dinner. And she's just kind of looking at me like, are you going to process this whole thing? 
was like, I'm starving. It's been a long day. Cause I had driven back from Columbus, went to the scar lounge, had a meeting with somebody at the scar lounge. Um, and then came back and, you know, she was like, are you fine? Like what's going on? I had to call mom and call dad. And they're both kind of like, what the fuck? Um, and then went to bed and everything was fine. Had a good sleep. I woke up and I went to take a shower cause I had to drive to Cleveland the next day. You're, you had blood in your pee. No, oh. God, that'd be fucked up. Wouldn't it? Um, yeah. I had snow leopard hands. <laughs> yeah, snow um, leopard. <laughs> like, what happened? <laughs> uh, no, so I woke up and I went to take a shower and I'm sitting in the shower. And you know how shower time is always like good reflection time? Yeah. Like you think about things in the shower, sure. right? Where your mind and brain is typically occupied throughout the day thinking about things you have to do. What's the next move? What do I got going on in an hour? What do yeah. I got going on in four hours? Oh, yeah. You have like a series of steps of things you have to work sure on. Sure do. When you're in the shower, it all goes away. Right? Yeah. Like you're just, you're in your own just space. You, just you and you. It'd be like you and a sauna, just right? Just you and you. <laughs> just me and me. And then I started thinking about it. And then I started like replaying everything in my head. And I had a fucking weird panic, panic attack. attack. Yeah. Oh my God. I was standing in the shower and I was like, I'm, I was hyperventilating. Of just how bad it could have been. That's what I was thinking yeah. about was like, I was thinking about <clears throat> the taillights or the headlights because I yeah, flipped around. So then I'm thinking about the headlights that I'm, I'm staring at. Yeah. And it's like, if anybody was closer at all, I would have been hit by someone going 70 miles an hour or who knows what side of the car. Yeah. You know, who knows how he almost flipped a semi truck just correcting, almost jackknifed in the middle of the highway. And what kind of damage and carnage could that, could that, that have could caused? Have so, like, the whole thing kind of replayed in my head. And I was like, wow, and then it could have been way worse. And then how it would have affected everyone else's lives? It's like a final destination type thing. A Where, like, bit. other people's like, I can't, I can't make it home tonight, honey. There's like, there's a semi truck on fire and like the lane's backed up. And like, I'm not going to be home for dinner. Right. Yeah, it's crazy. People's lives could have been changed. Yeah, but no one's lives are really changed at all. No. And I, I'm sure most Ohioans, when they see cars spin out, they go, oh, that sucks. <laughs> Dude, no, no one <laughs> no stops. No one stops. <laughs> no one stops. Goes, oh, that sucks. But in all fairness, like, I looked safe and cozy off on the side of the road. You know <laughs> I, what I mean? Like, my car wasn't flipped I over. Re- my car was flipped I over. Remember, so I'm I remember us going to a fucking, I want to say it was OzFest. Oh, and Columbus. we saw that car flip over? Well, oh, dude, that was and wild. And we saw... We saw, okay, there's a semi-truck on the opposite side of the highway, all right? And the semi-truck is going, and you see a wheel detach. Right, And you see a wheel and a tire roll down into the median, jump up over onto our side of the highway, hit a car, and send that car into the ditch where it flips over. Yeah, that was wild. And you know what we all did? Nothing. Oh, that sucks. <laughs> we're like, fuck, that sucks. I mean, we're on our way to OzFest. Yeah, like, you're going to OzFest. You're not you going to wait. You, you can't blame us. You don't want to miss Ozzy. Skid yeah. Row was playing, too, and I was super stoked for it. Yeah, that was. I remember that show. That was a good show. Yeah. That was a good OzFest. It was hot as fuck. I remember, like, almost dying of heat Sometimes stroke, like, people's times. lives aren't worth missing a good show. <clears throat> That's true. I do think, though, had I flipped over or, like, he jackknifed, obviously, it would have been a little bit different. But It would have been a lot different. But, dude, it was weird. It was like someone was on my side. Like, I don't know if it was Shark Tooth Necklace or... I'd like to say it is. I'd like to think it was like... Kale's um, a pure soul. I would like to think it was like um, like some old dead actor. It was just like, I ain't gonna let him die today. Oh, yeah. No, I sure won't. And yeah. then, like, that guy saved me. Maybe your shark, possible. shark tooth is, like, haunted by the guy in the movie Jaws that gets chomped up at the end. No, that'd be dope. You know, the drunk? Yeah. I like that guy. Takes his legs out. What if he saved you? That would be cool. That'd be cool. Wow. You're not you're not thinking of Richard Dreyfus. You're thinking of the other guy. Yeah, the old yeah. fucked up guy. Like a guy who looks like his name should be Smokey. The guy that behind the scenes everybody's like, Yeah, he's like that in real life too. Yeah, just a rough and he's tumble like a kind drunk. Of dude. <laughs> yeah. I like those guys. Um so on this today's episode. It's about shark teeth. No review. And we are going to be discussing some of the, and really, again, the segment of which I was thinking of the concept in my own head was all centered around lessons learned in the cigar world. Yeah. You know, what things have I learned over time? What things have Chris has Chris learned over time? Um, but, in particular, just about, hey, there's these things that you kind of struggle through. There's these things that you learn along the way. How do we shorten that learning curve? And that's the whole intention. And I want to role play it with you, bro. I want to role play it. Mm. I don't you know? know how we can do that, but well, you know, we 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 set up a scenario. We set up a scenario where it's like 
here's a life lesson and maybe i'm your subconscious or maybe i'm a person you're talking to uh, i don't think that's gonna work <laughs> i will try <laughs> i don't think i will a... <laughs> i will try to interject for, for the content can, i've created not sure can i be possible. like the tom hanks narrator so as things are playing out and you're telling a story i'm like talking over it i'd rather you be a morgan freeman narrator morgan freeman <laughs> <laughs> i wish i could do a really good morgan freeman i wish he could say he got the best of him <laughs> yeah andy and, dufresne andy dufresne <laughs> <laughs> yeah um, i'm game so let's let's take a quick break or is it a good time yeah or i could be your interpreter where mm, mm. you're explaining it very verbosely you know or like real technically and i'll be like over here both signing and chopping it up into digestible bits okay <laughs> that's fair <laughs> Um, or you could just be a part of the conversation. There's that dynamic too. I suppose that's fair as well. That's probably what we'll likely do. Um, we're going to take a quick break, everybody. We'll be back at you guys in just a minute. Hang tight. Welcome back to the hot ticket. We have a review for you today. We are reviewing. (laughs) I'm not going to spoil it. That's for an upcoming episode. We're on the wrong episode. You're still, if you're still with us, you're on that episode where we're going to be talking about lessons learned with Corey Allen. It's literally and with then, both of us. Oh, yeah. I'm in here, too. So, <laughs> life lessons learned with Corey and Chris Allen. Yeah. We should have, like, a segment intro to that where it's, uh, do you remember that lady who used to be on the radio? Delilah. Oh, dude, yeah. The worst fucking dad used to listen to her on Light 99.9. Yeah. Delilah. People knew what I'm talking about. Yeah. You guys, there's not a lot of radio kids out there, but in the cigar industry, there's a, there's a ton of old people who have listened to the radio, and I know you all listen to Delilah. Yeah. God, she was a Hi, this is Delilah. She? You're on the air. What's God, your name? Worst. Or what can I Do you help remember you that shit? Hi, I'm Tabitha. My husband's all beating me and shit. And I'm just trying to find boys and I get help. Oh, it's like, you know what? Her overly soft voice was, it was too maddening. It was maddening because she was oh. too she was too calm in the most intense of situations for yeah, the other human was. being. Yeah, she definitely was. Like it's like a it's like a like a really off putting therapist. Yeah, she was. She was the worst. Um, we got we got a lot of content to cover, so let's get into this. Um, so this particular segment, we're going to be talking about storage and selection. Typically, um, there's well, there's numerous amounts of ways you can store cigars, of course. Um, I've had a bunch of people who have reached out to us and said, what's the best thing to do, right? Because I store cigars in many ways. I've got wine indoors. I've got ones that are like, I've got the one that's uh, completely self-contained. I have the other one where I've had to Frankenstein the fuck out of it. I've got Tupperware. I've got a desktop humidor. I've stored cigars in any fucking way possible that you could possibly store them. So what I want to go over is just some of the things that we've learned over a period of time, the what not to do's, the what to do's. Um, and I, I will put it this way. I want to start out the conversation and saying, that there's not really a whole ton of right or wrong ways to do these things. A lot of it comes down to preference on how you want to store, what environment you're storing in. What's more um, economical. What's more economical. Does it fit a budget that you have? Um, so we'll get into that. So first off, there's many things you can use to actually store cigars, right? So you'll see ones um, that will come from a B&M shop or like a Cigar of the Month Club that will have a sealable pack with a Boveda pack in them. Right, and they'll be at like a 69 RH or whatever. Um, So you can keep a lot of cigars held in those packs for an extended period of time. So if you're receiving those, you're wondering how to store cigars, save some of those packs. I save a lot of mine. So a lot of when we get ones that come in on a continuum, I typically save those packs, even if it's something where I'm just traveling a short distance or I'm giving some something to someone else. I typically keep them just to give to other people because they are good storage. You want to maintain a proper humidity in those cigars. Keep those packs that they come in. They're sealable. Keep the little Beveda packs that they come with as well. Maybe even the beads. They even give you little you can beads. You give the little beads as well. Make sure there's enough humid traveling in that pack. Um, so even those that come in from a Cigar of the Month Club or come in maybe from a manufacturer, you get the BM store, save those. They're always good to have on hand in case you need extra storage or in case you're giving cigars to someone else. Yes, absolutely. But the question also remains is there's a lot of new smokers on this show probably. 
right? Some experienced smokers know how to handle and store their cigars in the proper way. But what if you're that? What if you're that new smoker and you're like, I want to do something with my friends. You know, maybe my friend's having a baby. Maybe tonight Tabitha's actually going to give me head. You want to celebrate the events, right? Sure. You want to hang out with your friends. You want to smoke cigar, but I don't know what to do with them. I bought them, which is a whole nother ordeal in of itself for a new smoker. Sure. Selecting a cigar. But that said, what do I do with them when I got them? Maybe I don't have beads. Maybe I don't got that Bovada pack. (laughs) (laughs) But it's Bovada, which is dumb. I wish it was Boveda. Just looks better. It's like Velveeta. But Bovada, now that's something. (laughs) But that said... One of the most effective ways, if you do not, if this is like a one-time thing and you do not want to go through the arduous process of ordering Boveda packs or Bavada packs or Bavada packs online or whatever, you don't have a human order to want to spend or invest the money in it, you know what you could do, my friend? Take those cigars, put them in a baggie, and store them in your freezer. That's true. Why store them in your freezer? Well, I got to tell you, it freezes them. Yeah. <laughs> Much like... Saving and storing your steaks. Yeah, so the freezer method is actually a pretty good method that a lot of people don't really discuss, but I've stored cigars in a freezer for a short period of time just to see how well it worked, and I will say this. It does kind of what it did to Sylvester Stallone and Demolition Man. It preserves the cigars. Yes, it does. For a long period of time. So it kind of, it holds in the correct humidity it kind of freezes everything in place the only thing that you have to do once they're out is you got to let them it's not even thawing you want to let them kind of get to room temperature again and it happens really quickly and it happens pretty quickly but the the storage of cigars in a freezer kind of ensure less fluctuation in temperature and humidity which could potentially cause issues over time so it actually is a very reasonable thing to do if you have the space to do it and if it's something that you really kind of want to hold on to it for a long time that you're not really grabbing in and out of maybe you want to kind of go through a little bit of an aging process or say hey i'm going to smoke these a year from now i'm not even going to touch them You've always got the freezer method is available for you. Yeah, and when Wesley Snipes breaks out of cryo prison, you need to release your Sylvester Stallones. That's true. You know what I'm saying? That is very true. Now, one of the things that most new cigar smokers will look at are desktop humidors. And these are the ones that are kind of fancy schmancy. They'll be black, lacquered wood. Um, They may have some gold features on them. Um... These are probably the most popular for new cigar smokers. Desktop humidors aren't bad, but they're also sometimes not good. Here's the challenge that I've always had with desktop humidors. I think they're great for anybody who's ever only going to kind of consistently have anywhere from 15 to 25 cigars at a time that you're really kind of smoking and rotating out of. What I will say is they're not good for long-time storage, and here's why. There's typically too much humidity and too much temperature fluctuation in those desktop humidors depending on the environment that you're in. What I've noticed over a period of time is a lot of those desktop humidors are meant to seal, right? You're supposed to get an airtight seal to make sure that no humidity is actually escaping the humidor. Over time, depending on the environment itself, those seals can dry up, they can crack a little bit. And what you start to see is, is you start to see humidity fluctuation. You'll likely see your cigars begin to dry out. Um, It can become an issue long-term. My father-in-law is actually dealing with this issue right now. And ironically enough, I told him about the Tupperware method, which we'll talk about in a minute, and he went and bought some Tupperware yesterday to try to breathe some life back into some cigars that really got dried out, even though it was in a fairly humid environment. He was not getting a seal at all on his humidor, and his his RH pack, his Zycol Crystal pack is just trying to pump out humidity to keep him in his cigars, and that humidity, as quickly as it's coming out of that pack, is going right out the humidor. So the desktop humidor, although I think sometimes is... They're pleasant to look at. I think they serve their purpose if you're kind of really rotating out on a consistent basis. But if you're trying to store long term, it may not be the best option for you. I agree. Now, I wish they did have tablet or maybe even mobile, uh, you know, humidors because they (laughs) got the desktop. Well, speaking of that, let's talk about mobile humidors. Yes. So there is such a thing as a travel humidor. And this is one thing that I and I've always wanted to make sure. That when it comes up in the discussion, we talk about these variances, these different types of humidors. 
but you can't dismiss the travel humidor, of which I think is very handy for anybody who is a cigar smoker. They're not expensive. One of the things I really do like about them is most units are kind of made in a pelican case type waterproof, watertight seal. Um, they hold, in my opinion, they hold humidity pretty well. I usually, I never use the actual um, humidity filter that they have built into the unit itself. I just don't like those. I will typically put a pack in there to Bo- make sure it maintains humidity. Bovada. And it typically always works really well. Now, the tra- I, have, I have a travel case. I have a case that's custom leather that I really enjoy, and I will just use that. I don't use that as much for storage. That'll be like, hey, if I'm going to the cigar lounge or bringing something with me, I can bring all my tools, bring a couple different cigars that I may want to smoke or give to somebody. That is not a long-term thing that I keep cigars in simply because there is no way to seal in anything. It's, it's And leather's very porous and absorbent. Right. It's, it's just to travel with. It's just to have, and it contains some tools that I have. But in terms of actually storing cigars for the long term, like I'll take my travel humidor with me to Puerto Rico here in a few weeks. Having one of those available... And having it with you, self-contained, waterproof, the whole thing, is actually a really good solution even if you're traveling and sometimes an even good solution if you're just trying to store a few at home. The case that I have, I think, stores 10. It's not anything obnoxious or huge, but they have ones that will store up to 60 different cigars. So you always have the travel humidors available as well, and they are really e- they are very easy to travel with. They're pretty small. I usually fit mine in my backpack, no problem. doesn't take up a lot of space either. Big question now is, is what do you do if it's like Chris and Corey, that's great. If I'm going to this shop, if I'm going to my friend's house, if I'm just a, you know, a casual smoker, everything you've said so far is easy breezy. I get it. I've been there. I've done that. But I'm a collector. I'm a sure. person that is out to find. You're like the, the, the uh, Jerry Seinfeld. Or Jay Leno of cigars as it relates to their vehicles. Sure. You're trying to find the most rare and exclusive shit and hold on to it and sort it in your garage until the day you die sometimes. Yeah, it's partially true, but it's not fully true. But I do smoke through some of my rare stuff. You do. I smoke through everything. Yeah, that is true. That said, what do you want to do if you've got such a vast inventory of cigars? And you want to make sure that they're all properly taken care of and maintained. This is where you come into what I would consider a lot of options. Yeah. One that's already been mentioned, which is Tupperware. Right. Tupperware is a great way of segmenting out your stock and maybe doing it by brand. Yeah. Maybe doing it by wrapper type. Yep. Maybe doing it by non-Cuban and Cuban. Yeah, that's true. And there's there's tons of ways you can do it. I do mine alphabetically, which doesn't work out well because um, <laughs> over time I'll have too much of something else, and then I'll over you know overfill a particular Tupperware. Sure. So I, I gotta I gotta figure that out long term. But you are correct. So we talked about Tupperware earlier. To me, Tupperware is king. This is the best option, not only from a budgetary perspective, but just maintaining consistency, scalability. You can always add to it. You can always change out. You can rotate. I will tell you this. I've had my Tupperware. Um, most of my Tupperware stuff has been, I've, I've had most of it for probably eight or nine months now, and I've never had to change out a pack. Not one time. Not once. No, nothing has dried out. It maintains humidity very, very, very well. Every once in a while, what I'll do is I'll, I will, and we'll talk about the, uh, um, the digital hydrometers as well. So I would actually drop my digital one in there for a period of time just to make sure that everything is kosher in terms of humidity and temperature. And it's always super consistent. Now, the Tupperware that I do have is airtight. It is waterproof. So it's a bit more expensive than just your normal Tupperware. I think most Tupperware would work fine, but I really wanted that tight seal seal. just to make sure nothing escaped. Um, And it's worked wonderfully. I mean, I'm nine, I'm probably nine months into it and I've never had an issue. And I'm rotating stuff in and out of those Tupperware all the time. Um, I really like the Tupperware because of the versatility. To me, that's the best part of having it. Like Chris said, you can expand it so you can always add to. You can, um, like the Tupperware that I get comes with like little post-it notes so you can write on them and just, it's, hey, this is the label for this particular pack. Like I have a Crown Heads Tupperware thing because of so many Crown Heads cigars. Um, So I've got that. I've got a Romacraft one as well that are just, that's only, that's the only thing that's in there. Nika Sueño and then I've got my, uh, 
my crown head ones, and then the rest of them are organized alphabetically. I use those to rotate out just normal inventory that I want to smoke on a regular basis. So I'm constantly opening, I'm constantly putting this stuff in, I'm putting, you know, taking old things out to smoke them. I may take some out to give giveaways. They're just super versatile. They're easy to get in and out of. Um, I prefer the Tupperware method personally over everything when it comes to versatility. Yes, I 100% agree. But the question now you might ask is, well, Chris and Corey, the problem is, is when I bring my friends back to see my great collection of stock cigars, I don't want them seeing a big old mess of Tupperware. It makes it look like I live in a low-income housing environment. (laughs) It makes it look like I don't got money. I, when I want to show off my cigars, I want to show my friends and families and lovers that I've got the most swank and cool way of storing them. Right. And some ways you can store them are through what we call wine adores or cool adores. Yeah. So the wine adore is, is perhaps, I think, amongst people who are really. I'd say when you go from that beginner to intermediate or even to that advanced level of smoking to where you're really, really starting to buy a lot of cigars, this tends to be where people get led in terms of storage would be the wine adored units. I think wine adored units are love hate. I've got two of them. There's one that I really, really like because it's self-contained, which we'll talk about the differences in that. And there's another one that is I Frankenstein the fuck out of. Because it just wasn't adequate out of the box. There's some manipulation I needed to do to it to make sure that it was doing what I needed it to do to store the cigars appropriately. So I do have a love-hate with most of these wine adore units. And I will tell you this. From a storage perspective, the capacity is really high. This is why people are buying these. If you have anywhere from 100 to 200 cigars, you can buy one of the smaller units and house those cigars just fine. It will hold boxes. It's got trays that you can store loose cigars in. It's got what you need for... Um, larger amounts of storage. You can buy units bigger than that, ones that are 400 count. I've got uh, the second unit that I bought. I think long term, it's not completely full, but it'll probably end up housing once I get a few more boxes. I'd say probably somewhere in the 250 to 300 range. Especially at the Corona size, for sure. Right, yeah. Smaller of a total, the more it holds, obviously. So I really like that unit. Um, Here's the differences between the two. I say one self-contained, the other one I Frankenstein the fuck out of. The self-contained, what I mean about that is that the humidity is actually built into the unit itself. So you don't need to have another passive humidity unit, which is what I have in the other one. So we talk about Zycar crystals that use um, PG solution. Um, you may have some Bovida packs that are just kind of thrown in there. You may have some Humasmart packs. There's different ways to create humidity. You may have a uh, one of the Oasis units, which is an active electronic unit pumping humidity through there all the time. There's different ways that you can pump in humidity into some of these humidors. The other one that I bought, however, is self-contained. It has a distilled water holder, and it actually, from that, produces humidity using that holder with a built-in active processing piece as opposed to a passive one, which you would have to put in one of the other ones. Now, it does come out at a premium. It's a little bit more expensive. It's more of a commercial unit, but it works great. I love the idea of self-containing. It will actually alarm. It will sound an alarm when there's not enough humidity in there anymore. There's not enough water to create humidity. So it's got some bells and whistles, some features that I like that are an act of convenience. I don't have to drop a digital hydrometer in there. It already has that built in. It'll tell me what the consistency is of the humidity itself and the temperature. Um, The other units, which would be like a winter or a cool air, they don't do that. So they're a bit different, or sorry, new air. They don't have that. So they have a, they have temperature control, but you've, and it'll show humidity. Um, Actually, I don't even know if it, does it show humidity? No, it's, so it has an analog dial on the front. Um, Just temperature control. Everything else you have to kind of figure out, which isn't a bad thing. They're less expensive. But here's my issue. My main issue with those units is this. You've got an air compressor that is constantly keeping temperature at where it needs to be. The compressors in most of those units are garbage. If you read reviews, and I dealt with it myself, those compressors and those fans likely will go out in a year or two. Um, And I believe believe the warranty is only a year. So if you did want to try to get something in for repair, you're likely not going to be able to. Um, my So my compressor didn't go out, but my fan went out. So it has a built-in fan. So what I did was, and this is why I said I Frankenstein the fuck out of this thing, 
is I took a CPU fan that actually has um, a speed control on it, and I, I kind of rigged it in electronically so I could control it the way that I need to control it. So I'm always pumping air through there. And that's just via like a USB ribbon cable. And I have an active USB unit that I can turn on and power off when I need to. Um, and it allows me to just keep that humidity pumping through those through those humidors. Because if those fans go out, what you do is, is you have, you have uh, your humidity is going to be different at each level of the humidor you can even take a digital hydrometer and you can put it on each level and you will you see the variances yeah. so you've got to make sure that you have adequate airflow through there to make sure that that humidity is actually being evenly distributed throughout the humidor itself which becomes a challenge in those units yes and it's still recommended that when you do have a cool air or a cool door either it's winter or or new air yeah. that you do still rotate your stock anyway um, always a good idea. It's always good to rotate your stock because sometimes uh, what's on the surface. Have you ever, um, now this is kind of reverse effect, but have you ever, well, no, not really. So have you ever like taken a, a die cut of, a, of, of, a, of the ground? You know, maybe it rained the previous day. Mm. And you, if you were to take out a segment of the ground, right? It just rained. You took out maybe two feet of, of soil you'll notice that the top is heavily moistured and you will notice that the bottom is significantly dry. The same thing happens to your cigars in your, in your cool door. Sometimes rotating the stop helps make sure that each cigar gets adequate moisture it needs in order to keep it maintained and prevent it from drying out and cracking. That is true. And that's just the, na that's just the nature of the beach, beast. And so like, you but know, also the beach, the beach too. Uh, beach works same way. Um, but that's the reality of it. So, I mean, if you're, if you're the type of person like, let's see if I can fit 496 cigars in this 450-count Coolador, you would be crazy not to rotate that stock probably once a month. Yeah, for sure. Because there are going to be some dry fucking cigars There's on that bottom. Yeah. Yeah, there, there definitely will be. So, it is, it is good to rotate from time to time. And it's also good just to check your inventory. I do a constant rotation typically like once every other month, and I do that for a couple reasons. One, I need to take my inventory. I need to know what I have. I need to know what I smoke. I surprise myself sometimes and go, oh, shit, I didn't realize I had that. Now I'm going to go smoke that. And just to keep, as Chris has stated, to keep everything consistent and to make sure that it's balanced, you'll want to do that from time to time in those larger units. Um, the other thing that I want to talk about real quick as we kind of finish up the storage piece of this is the difference between an analog hydrometer and a digital hydrometer. I will say this, I've never had good luck with the analog hydrometers. To me, they're harder to calibrate, they're less consistent, they don't really always tell the tale of what you what is actually being represented in a particular unit. And I will say if you have a larger unit, get yourself a digital one. You can get, uh, Boveda has one, Sensor Push has one. Um, I use the Sensor Push. It works great. The only thing you need to be cognizant of is you're going to have to change out a battery over a period of time. But I like Sensor Push because it'll send me alerts, send me alarms. Hey, if there's a fluctuation, why? Like even in the summertime, you get a little bit of that sun that comes through my basement window. It'll heat up just a little bit and it'll tell me, Hey, we're above 70 degrees now, Bubbo. We've got to, <laughs> we've got to cool it back down. Um, so I like the idea that one, it's very easy to calibrate. It's consistent. It's always going to tell you exactly what's represented in a particular unit that you have that's housing cigars. But not only that, it's just really easy to use. I mean, the push notifications to your phone are always nice to have because if you're connected to Wi-Fi, even if you're away, you can see how, how everything is being controlled, even if you're not at home. Um, I mean, there was a time literally, I remember I was traveling for work. And it pushed like I think the humidity dropped significantly, and I had uh, I had Lauren remove the Zycar unit and fill it up with distilled water, just to make sure that it had. I was like, hey, can you do me a favor? I was like, you're gonna see this thing is gonna be up at the top. Can you take that out? Pour a little distilled water in it. Make sure those crystals are starting to to rehydrate, and just put that bad boy back in there because I forgot yeah. to fill it when I left. So, it's kind of nice to have the push notifications exactly okay. Is this humidor balanced with temperature and humidity as intended? The sensor push units and the Boveda units, um, they do a really good job of telling a correct tale where the analog ones sometimes are really challenging. 
Um, just dealt with that last week, again, with my father-in-law. His was actually reading too high, and what we ended up figuring out is that the humidity actually was far too low because he pulled a cigar out, yeah. and it just started cracking on him. And he goes, I don't know if that's possible. He goes, my unit was even showing 75, 80 RH. And I said, that's either not calibrated correctly or you have some other issues. And what we ended up finding out was two things that it wasn't calibrated correctly. He actually recalibrated it at work because where he works, they have, um, they have hydrometers all over the place. Oh yeah. Um, hygrometers, hygrometers, hygrometers. They have digital hygrometers all over the place because of where he works. So he just calibrated to that and he goes, wow, it was way off. And not only that, but he also did have a bad seal or no seal at all. Really? on his desktop humidor, which was just everything was escaping out in terms of humidity driving everything out. So um, make sure, I would say at the end of it, when we're talking all things storage, make sure it's conducive for the environment that you're in. I would say if you're looking for budget, definitely go with Tupperware. If you're looking for aesthetic, go with the wine and doors um, because they are very appealing and pleasing to the eye. Yes. Um, if you're looking for, Hey, I'm not gonna, I'm not always going to have a ton of cigars that I need to rotate in and out of. I just like to keep 15, 20 at a time. A desktop humidor may be for you. I'd say just be cognizant of some of the issues that you may run into. Um, and I would also say this, make sure that you're reading instructions in terms of calibration. If you're going to continue using an analog hygrometer, if you're not use something like a sensor push, that's actually going to get you the correct information that you can calibrate all the time. And please, oh, please. If you've got wood in your humidor setup, please season it. Season your wood. Now, you might be saying, Chris, what the hell is season? You telling me I got to add oregano, maybe some salt and pepper to my cigars? No, 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 my friend. No, 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 no. What I'm saying is that make sure your wood is properly humidified before adding your cigars to it. Yeah, there will be instructions that you get for each humidor size. Um, not only in desktop humidor, but if you are looking to buy one of the new air units or one of the winter units, or like what I have is the Lieber commercial unit, they typically always have seasoning instructions and all like use YouTube. There's guys that have so many tips and tricks as far as seasoning stuff, um, seasoning the cedar wood and making sure that it's moist going into it. Cause the last thing you want to do is put cigars in right off the bat where the wood is going to absorb all of the moisture and it's going to absorb all the humidity over a long period of time, which is going to leave nothing for your cigars. So you want to make sure that a humidor is, I'm telling you, spend and devote the time and making sure that you do this process right. Because if you do it wrong, it's going to mess up. And all this inventory that you've bought, all these cigars that you've bought, are potentially going to get dried out and damaged. So just be cognizant of that. Yeah. Um, I didn't want to go too much into large cabinet stuff. We can do that in another segment. I don't think that's necessarily applicable to a lot of our audience. But you do have lar- even larger storage that you can use the Oasis active units thousand, for. Thousand unit. Thousand count units. Yeah. Um, maybe we'll get into that in another segment. But this is more practical, personal um, stuff that I think probably hits 90% of the cigar smokers, sure. 95% of the smart cigar smokers out there. Um, before we get into selection, though, I do want to take a quick break. I got to puff up my tail a little bit. Okay. Um, so we'll take a quick break, and then we'll be back at you guys in a minute with cigar selection process. Hang tight. All right, we're back. Welcome. We're back at the second part of this. We hope you enjoyed the storage piece of it. Um, of course, we didn't get everything right. We try to keep this podcast collapsed in time a little bit, so we don't want to get uh, we don't want to get too much in the weeds, too much detail around everything in terms of uh, storage. We could talk about it literally for probably three hours. Um, just wanted to hit on some of the highlights, some of the topics, especially the things that I've learned over the course of time, my preferences, which could end up being your preferences. For sure. We don't want to be those college professors that you fall asleep while doing his three-hour little fucking anecdote. Right. That's boring. That's boring. Um, So the second part of this is going to be talking about selection overall. Lessons learned in selecting cigars. And this ends up being a topic of discussion typically for people who are fairly new to cigars that want to acclimate themselves more to the cigar world. This becomes a challenge because it feels overwhelming. It felt overwhelming for me when I was really diving deep into cigars. Now, I've been smoking since I was 19. The first cigar I ever smoked was a CAO America, which I've said on this podcast before, and I've been smoking consistently since. Um, It took me a while to get away from smoking those types of cigars. 
And when I say those types of cigars, I mean anything in the CEO lineup and in particular cigars that really kind of had a profile similar to that of the America. Um, the one thing that I want to make sure that I get out before anything is explore. Explore different variances, different types of cigars. Um, if you're really trying to get into cigar smoking, you always ask the question, what should I have? I really have preference for this. What I would say is just explore. You'd be surprised at the things you like that you typically otherwise wouldn't like or enjoy. Um, there's a insane amount of cigars on the marketplace currently. And although some of them have a lot of similarities, there's a lot of diversity too in terms of varietals, in terms of tobacco and where it's grown, um, different methods used to actually uh, construct cigars, what components are you using, what's that blending process look like. There's such a variation from not only from manufacturer but individual cigar to individual cigar that I would challenge you to explore as much as you possibly can because you would be surprised at some of the things that you would like that you otherwise think you probably wouldn't like. Just like beer, right? The craft beer boom happened and people are really acclimated to this one thing. I really like this thing, but I'm telling you, explore over time. You expand your palate. You would be shocked at the things that you'd end up enjoying. But in order to reach that type of level of expert opinion and developing your palate, it's important to look at where we begin. And sometimes the most common place for you to begin as a, a new beginning smoker is you walk into your local B&M. And when you walk into your local B&M, usually you're greeted by an older gentleman. Typically. Some, typically. Sometimes younger. It just depends. The times are a-changing. That's for sure. But one of the most challenging and most daunting tasks as a new beginning smoker is to look upon the selection of thousand cigars that wrap around you in this giant humidor room or shoving unit and figuring out where the fuck do I begin? That's true. That's true. It's a very overwhelming process. And it actually kind of segues into what I want to talk about in terms of where do you get your information and how, who helps you with the selection? There's two ways to do it. You can do the research on your own. You can figure out some of the things that you like. You could go and smoke things at random. You could try to do a little bit of the research online and say, hey, I like this particular cigar. What else is out there that's kind of like it, has the same kind of look and feel, may have similar components. Or you can put your trust into what we would consider cigar experts, hopefully. I say hopefully because there are a lot of brick and mortar stores out there who have great personnel on staff that can really direct you where you need to go in terms of this is what I like in a flavor profile or here's something dynamically different I want to try. They can really help kind of navigate you towards some of those things. But also, buyer beware, there are certain brick and mortar stores where they don't have that kind of personnel on staff and they have different motives for trying to sell you something. So it's not uncommon that a brick and mortar, if you're not really sure what you want, is going to steer you towards what they want you to smoke, which could be something that they are doing totally in their favor and not into yours. So you've got to be aware of some of those things. There are certain times where manufacturers will give the cigar store benefits, spiffs, so on and so forth for for actually pushing a particular line. And I've seen it before out and about. I've seen it many times where they're going to push you where they're told to push you. Um, so kind of have an idea going into it what you want and be wary of those things. It's kind of like going to um, it's kind of like going to a dealership and saying, hey, I'm here for a brake change, and then you end up with four new tires. Like you end up with something that you totally didn't need, totally didn't want, um, and they sold you on it anyway, despite you know the not kind of exploring that needs analysis of what you're looking for. So just be cautious and aware of that. Again, some are better than others. I would typically go in there with an idea of something that you're looking for from a flavor perspective. That way you give them a baseline to kind of direct you where you need to go. Um, if you go in there with nothing, they're likely going to just steer you towards what they want to sell you. And on top of that, sometimes you're caught in a situation by which you go in there and you say, Hey, what's a good cigar to smoke? Ooh, that's a, that's a fair question, right? You as the consumer, you're wanting sure. to leverage the expertise of the person that works there. Here's where it can be problematic, and this is where it's kind of a crapshoot. This is the unfortunate part about it. A good cigar rep or a good store representative or salesperson will ask you additional questions as to 
what are you looking to what type of flavor profile we've got things that are lighter we've got things that are bolder we've got things that are spicy we got things that are not spicy and sometimes they they'll ask you additional questions in order to steer you to something that you're more likely to enjoy than not right but then there's the fabled evil one the fable evil rep that literally will go you ask them well what's a, cig- a good cigar i should buy and they go the Crow Magnon from Roma Craft. You're a new smoker. And they're 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 pushing a cigar on you. You don't know it sounds cool. Sounds mystical. Sure. Sounds real mystical. And like, well, let me let me bring you over to this shelf here and I'll pull out this Crow Magnon for you. And it's a good fucking cigar. I'll give it that. But as a new beginning smoker, they have maybe recommended something that to you that you do not want to be smoking. Right out the gates. This is true. Now, it could be their favorite. That's possible. It's one of their favorites. They're just pushing off a favorite on you. That's good and all. But if they are unaware of your experience level, or they are just blindly ignoring the, their intuition to help you find something that will work for you, you could be caught in a situation where you get a cigar that's too spicy, too fucking, too much nicotine. You have a bad experience when you smoke it. Right. Whether you get sick or it tastes like garbage to you, whatever the case may be. And it could totally turn you off from cigars. Which we don't want. Which we don't want. Yeah, so I would say, that's why I'm saying be cautious when you're going in and you're offering up, this is what I'm looking for and suggestions coming back. Um, I would say do your research beforehand. Um, there's a ton of information online that you can really kind of research certain flavor profiles of certain cigars, what kind of... Um, Flavors are imparted in certain cigar, I would say cigar, cigar varietals from different regions too. Um, do your research beforehand so you at least have a baseline of information to go on when you're looking for those selections. Um, one of the other things that I really wanted to talk about was, and this is just something for me that has never really been clearly defined. I don't want to say it's not been clearly defined. It's just misused. Um, and that's the difference between body versus strength and intensity. A body of cigar is the weight of the cigar, the weight of the smoke in your mouth. That's the body of the cigar. When you say a full-bodied cigar, it means that it's producing a dense amount of smoke. It's heavy in the mouth. It's heavy in the draw. Strength and intensity are completely different. So we're talking about intensity of cigars. We're really talking about flavor. You're talking about strength of cigars. It could be a component of the nicotine content within the cigar. It could be the flavors that it imparts in terms of spice, that boldness. Um, But I did want to make sure that we made a distinction there because they're often both misused. Um, So just more of a definitional thing that I want to put out out there for everybody. Um, The other thing that I wanted to talk about, and this is something that I very much kind of got sunk into before that exploration process. And I always thought dark wrapper means a much more bold cigar. Light wrapper means a much lighter cigar, much more light in terms of flavor, probably a little bit more subtle. That's not always the case. Don't look at the wrapper types and determine right off the bat that this is what this flavor profile is going to be. I've had a lot of very dark, dark wrappered cigars that offer up a very smooth, creamy, light balance throughout the entire cigar. I've had a lot of cigars that have a lighter shade Connecticut wrapper on them that are packed full of very peppery, rich, pungent fillers that offer up something that is, I would say in terms of flavor, a lot more bold. So don't let the wrapper type fool you. Some of the best cigars in both worlds are not as they appear on the surface level. So again, do your research in those and ask somebody at a B&M and say, hey, I want to explore something that has this particular kind of flavor profile for it. So you may end up getting steered towards something that on the surface level looks like, well, there's no way that's what that could be. But I'm telling you, if you research and you find out, like I use the example of like Connecticut shade wrapper. Mm -hmm. Most people who are not cigar smokers typically think that a Connecticut shade wrapper cigar is always going to be kind of light and it's going to be smooth. It's going to be creamy. It's going to be subtle. And that's not always the case. I use the example of black label trading companies, Connecticut shade lawless. That cigar, although on surface level looks quite tame, quite quaint, you want to snuggle up with it in bed. When you start smoking that bad boy, you're dancing with the devil. That cigar is really, really rich in flavor. It has 
a heavy spice component at the beginning, and that's because there's a whole bunch of filler types in there that are represented below the surface of which you can't see. So don't always make the correlation that a light cigar is subtle and sweet, and then a dark wrapper is going to be more bold and in your face and more intense. That's not always the case, and yeah. typically isn't the case. Yeah, it's all about the blend. It's all about the blend. Um, the other thing that I wanted to talk about real quickly, and this is something that I don't want to say is new, but it may be good for new cigar smokers really trying to get into smoking that really don't know what they like yet, but are willing to explore. Try a cigar of the month. Those packs are really good. I still subscribe to cigars of the month. There's certain packs that I will bring. You have, um, like I do cigar federation, of course, show sponsor my cigar pack. They're always sending you random things, cigarclub.com, luxury cigars. I'm naming off some of the ones that are just in the, in the marketplace. And they all have variances as far as what they send and what they do um, and how they curtail their packs. But what they're doing simply is giving you variety. So you always have the option of being kind of surprised, getting variety in these particular cigar packs that are catered in a certain way. I like them because I'm always surprised when I get them. I get something new that I don't have to think about. I am not good about going to a humidor and just picking something out. I'm the guy who wanders and walks through for 40 minutes and can't make a fucking decision. If I have someone make a decision for me, boom, I've got five cigars right there that I can now enjoy and smoke. And you may like them, you may not like them, but at least you get to try something new. So if you're willing to explore, which I highly recommend doing in the cigar world, these Cigar of the Month clubs are great for that because you don't have to think about the selection. You're getting five random cigars at different variances and times throughout the month. Yeah, and you know when I started smoking cigars... Um, I didn't really, I wasn't aware of the month clubs, you're right. The cigar right. of the month clubs, but I would, but I was the quickest way for you to develop your palate of what you don't like and what you do like is just, it is, it's just having a, a wide spectrum of selections of cigars, various different wrapper types, filler types, Vitolas, which are the sizes. Um, and that's like the quickest way, like going head first in, in the cigar community or in trying any type of blend from any brand is probably the quickest way you're going to find what you like. Yeah, for sure. Um, one of the things I will also say is as much as you possibly can support your local B and M. I know sometimes they don't always have the variety that you may be looking for. We have some challenges here in just this Ohio area and Ohio in general. There's not a ton of cigar lounges out there, and some have certain inventory, some have other certain inventory, and you can't carry everything. They can only carry so much. But I will say, support your local B&Ms as much as possible in that product selection. They're great to go to. Um, it, they're engaging and they're interactive. Uh, you certainly get to spend a lot of quality time with other cigar smokers. So I'd say support them and make sure that you're buying your singles or even boxes from those particular places. They usually do box discounts. Uh, most places do. Um, so you have an advantage there. But i say support your local B&M if you can. And if they don't have the variety you're looking for, then default to the online approach. I do a really healthy approach of both. Chris and I are always in and out of um, certain uh, cigar lounges here locally. We like to support them as much as we possibly can. But if they don't have the variety we're looking for, they don't have something stocked, that's okay. Then we default to the online approach. You buy things online. You can do some of the Cigar of the Month clubs. I think there's a healthy balance of approach. But I say if you can, support your local guys, man. They're there to help you. They're there to give you an experience that you otherwise wouldn't get. And they're, especially if you're a newbie, they're there to help you with the product selection. The best ones, they'll steer you in the right direction. They won't steer you where they want you to go. They'll steer you where you want to go. But Chris and Corey, but if you're buying certain cigars online and certain ones in your brick and mortar, what type of ones can't you get in your local brick and mortar? I would say, and Corey's right, it really depends on clientele too. Like it depends on what type of, people coming in and out of there that are basically whatever they're rotating stock in quickly sure or rotating through is what they're going to primary put focus on because that's how they drive sales that's how they keep the lights on and keep the store open but the other thing that i've noticed with most b&ms which is probably one of the bigger challenges for places that don't have big humidors is getting their hands on small batch like blends or cigars from brands and that comes really down to two factors. One, maybe not known, right? Maybe sure. you're an experienced smoker that are looking for small batch productions. Maybe not known by the, the store, which you can always recommend to them 
and hopefully they'll buy a box for you. And then yeah, there's bring it in. there's definitely some B and M's out there that are very receptive to that. Yeah. If they get enough people asking for something, they will seek to go bring it. Yeah. In. What the second one is, they might just not have the space for it. They either don't know about it or they don't have the space for it. And then the third time is, and this is probably the most common reason why you might, if you're looking for a particular cigar in your local B and M is because if they're small batch runs, they're likely picking storefronts that are going to give them the best opportunity to burn through their cigars because they only are selling so many of them. Sure. And they want to put them in stores that they know are going to sell them. We call that allocation. Yeah. And that does happen. That's a really, that's a very real thing in the cigar world. So if it's a limited production cigar, there's only so many that are going out. They're going to be allocated to the places that can sell through them quickly. And it's just a reality. And some B&Ms, they start off small and they continue to expand over time. There's, there's a way to build that up over time, which we've certainly seen before. So yeah. um, the last thing, and the one thing that I really wanted to end with that I think is arguably the most important in terms of product selection is don't let anyone tell you you're smoking the wrong stuff smoke what you enjoy smoke the things that you like to smoke although i may not agree with it there's people that i know smoke certain cigars and i go oh come on man there's so many good things out there and then i kind of have to step back a little bit and go hey if they're smoking and they're enjoying that's all that fucking matters there's nothing else that matters if it's an acid if it's a macanudo if you're just stuck on fuentes it doesn't matter as long as you're sitting down enjoying a cigar and you're supporting the community as a whole. You know, I talk about the exploration process and I think that's a really healthy thing to do just to figure out what you do like. But certainly if there's something you enjoy, don't let anybody tell you you're doing it the wrong way because you're not. As long as you're sitting down enjoying a cigar, that's all that matters. Yeah, and if they're friendly and not pieces of shit, they won't care anyway. That's true. That's true. Which I will say... There are cigar snobs, and I find myself talking to cigar snobs just because of the reputation that we have. Like it's like a chat, almost maybe a challenge or an opportunity for them to like put their stink on you. Yeah, you know what I'm saying. Yeah, where it's like, oh, you smoke that, like it's almost like a a way of discrediting you. (laughs) Yeah, but that said, like even though I know there's cigar snobs out there, and I have met several of them. I want to say from a 99.9% perspective, though, everybody is good people in the cigar community. Yeah, for sure. I I would agree with that. And they will not give two shits what you were smoking. Right. Yeah, the great thing about the cigar community as a whole is that everybody's able to impart knowledge on everybody else, right? I love talking to people who smoke something that's entirely different from what I smoke, and they convince me to try something that I otherwise wouldn't try. Those are my favorite conversations. Yeah, totally. I love that exploration process. But again, don't tell you, don't let anyone tell you you're doing it wrong. As long as you're smoking, you're doing it the right way. Yep. Um, that was fun. Yeah, I really like doing a uh, lessons learned thing. These are just things that you and I have experienced over a period of time, and again, it's just imparting our own knowledge and it's not to say that it's right or wrong or indifferent or whatever it may be. It's just things that we've experienced over time just to help you guys out. And of course we're always open to questions and suggestions. So, you know, through the idea of like product selection and even product storage, there are certain things that I've done that I've, I've time and time again, tell people, okay, here's exactly, you know, that happened. Here's exactly how I store and here's how I do all these things. You know, this podcast was intended to just push some of those things out there. But if you do have additional questions, you can always reach out to us. We're happy to answer any questions you have, help out anywhere we can be suggestive as much as possible. Yeah. And if you like the idea of maybe saying, Hey, I, I can't smoke indoors. How do I battle the elements? How do I make sure I have the best smoking experience outdoors and rain, sleet, shine, you know, like fucking 100 degrees out? Hit that like button. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) That's for sure. Hit this like button right here. Yep. Right here. Hit that. Hit that like button. And then hit that bell notification so that you don't miss when we (laughs) post. Yeah, don't miss when we post. And also... Hey, we are on YouTube. So if you're watching this video right now, I will say a thank you. Thanks. Um, so we are on YouTube. So please subscribe. You can watch all the podcasts on YouTube going forward, which is awesome. Yep. Also, I know I say this before, and I say it after every episode. You can subscribe, rate, and review on iTunes. And, of course, any any particular platform that our podcast is on. But now we, we are making rating this podcast easier. So if you go to ratethispodcast.com backslash or slash hot ticket, 
you can actually very seamlessly go in and rate this podcast because I know sometimes like figuring out and navigating in iTunes is kind of a weird thing. So you can click this link. It'll take you directly to it. It'll show you exactly how to do it. And we greatly appreciate if you guys would rate this podcast on iTunes and all of our other platforms. It greatly, greatly, greatly helps what we're doing. Um, it creates suggestions or in, within the platform. It helps build our audience base, which allows us to do bigger and better things with what we want to do to give you guys more content and material. It's all in a cycle. It's all the circle of life. Plus, if you like seeing our pretty faces, come on to this YouTube channel where you can watch us right here. That's true. Make sure that, you know, the number gets above the 11 that you see right here because right. that 11 views is really just me and Corey right. because we're like narcissistic. We just, keep, we just keep watching. And we just keep watching. But make sure that make sure that, that 11 turns into a 12 so you, you continue to watch it. That's true. Yeah. Yeah. And again, ratethispodcast.com slash hot ticket to rate now you can do that and we'd greatly appreciate it all right got some stuff to do today it's saturday it's dreary out it's a little cold it was snowing but we're gonna make the best of it so thank you everybody for listening this will conclude episode 135 which is our lessons learned storage and selection we'll be back at you next week with episode 136 see everyone see ya Nats? Do you like my kitty outfit? So many Nats. Wait, hold on. Get them with your paws. Here. Just like regular cats do. <laughs> yeah. Are you gonna need me? <laughs> <laughs> they do that like a little. Hold on, hold on. Take out the jugular. <laughs>